Hello, good evening. <clears throat> Hello. All right. We have about seven people here. We're waiting. We have about 87 registered, so I'm just going to wait for a few minutes uh, while everybody enters. For those of you who just came on, we're just waiting a few more minutes. Uh, looks like 12 of you are, are on now, and you have 70 some registrants, yeah. and so we're just waiting a little bit longer. I think we'll begin now. Well, welcome everyone uh, <clears throat> to the first webinar 
that uh, the Honors College at Belmont Abbey is hosting an education for happiness. Uh, please pardon Dr. Wren and myself. Uh, this is the first time we've ventured into webinar land. We're a great books guys, and so um, we don't have much experience with this, but we really wanted to have time to spend with prospective students and their parents to talk with them a little bit about our program and go over some things um, and hi the highlights of the program and, um, and allow you to ask us questions and, and answer those in real time. Uh, of course, we'll be sending a follow-up email with our contact information and are very happy to continue the conversation uh, after the webinar is over. So um, let's just begin with uh, some brief introductions of ourselves. Uh, Dr. Basil, the third uh, member of our faculty uh, who's going to be with us tonight, uh, is running a little bit late. There's a large uh, lecture on campus tonight, and she's uh, at dinner with a speaker, and she'll be here in, in just a few moments. But my name is Dr. Joe Isaki. Uh, I am the director of the Honors College here at Belmont Abbey. I am uh, taught in the government and political philosophy department for 10 years here. And I'm an alum of Belmont Abbey. I graduated in 2004 with a degree in political science and economics. I then went to Baylor University to study political science. I met my wife there, got my PhD, and have been back since 2010 uh, teaching here at the Abbey. And my wife and my five children and I, we live about 50 minutes from campus. So welcome. So my name is Dr. Joshua Wren, and my wife and and I and our children, we live actually just right down the block from the campus. Uh, and I mentioned that in part uh, because we spend a lot of time here uh, interacting with students. I take children for walks on campus here pretty much every night. Uh, and in terms of my academic background, my major areas of emphasis are the intersections of uh, political philosophy and literature. My first scholarly book is on Tolkien and political philosophy, J.R.R. Tolkien and political philosophy. Uh, and then my other major area of emphasis is theology and literature. So uh, in what ways do poets help, uh, contribute to our understanding of the nature of God? Or some of the big questions uh, that, I, that I've pursued for quite a while. I've been teaching for 10 years or so and have always had a, a deep love for the great books approach to education ever since I first encountered it in graduate school. Uh, my, my major professor who became a kind of mentor uh, basically opened up the entire world of great books for me in a class called The Quarrel Between Poetry and Philosophy, uh, where we read both poets and philosophers on that question. And that was sort of the beginning of the end in the best sense for me. <laughs> well, <clears throat> Uh, we're going to continue to go through some of the details of our Honors College as we talk about happiness this evening. But in the way of a brief introduction to our program, the Honors College at Belmont Abbey is a new program. It was instituted two years ago. And as we talk about our curriculum, we uh, only have two classes in our new Honors College, freshmen and sophomores. And so next year we'll be adding our, uh, our third year. Welcome, uh, Dr. Basil is just arriving here. Oh, sorry, there's another event on campus. Okay. Um, well, let me, let me uh, allow Dr. Basil to introduce herself uh, and then I'll, I'll, I'll go back, so yeah. Um, hi, I'm Dr. Christine Basil. Um, I am delighted to be a part of this honors college here. Um, let's see, I, I came last August and um, I did my PhD at Baylor University in Waco, Texas. I don't know if you've met my good friends Chip and Joanna Gaines there. Um, not my girlfriends, I just, they're really cool. Um, and I did my work primarily in classical political philosophy, um, Aristotle's rhetoric primarily. And so I teach a number of classes here in the Honors College um, involved that primarily focus on Aristotle, Plato, um, America, Machiavelli, some other really smart people. Um, and I am just delighted to be part of this community here. So welcome, hi. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, so we have, um, just the way of a brief introduction, the Honors College is a brand new program, two years old, uh, a great books program, and we'll, we'll be getting into some of the details about that later. Um, but it's really a, a, an exciting program that's gotten national attention uh, from a number of, from Catholic, Christian, um, and other news sources. And we're really excited to share more about that with you tonight. In particular, we want to relate the conversation to the question of happiness tonight. So our 
The title of our webinar is An Education for, for Happiness. Um, and I wanted to share with you before we began, um, actually I wanted to get you guys interacting a little bit with us here and start off before we talk about happiness uh, by having a little poll for you guys. Uh, I'm learning the bells and whistles of technology here and I'm pretty impressed with myself. So I'm going to launch a poll and if you would, please uh, answer the questions. Yeah. <laughs> So this question is about what's important to you in choosing a college. Yeah. We got an answer. I don't know if you guys can see this. I can share it when it's done, but almost everyone has answered. This is great. All right. All right, well, I hope all of you can see that. Um, so all of these things, uh, in some way, we're going to touch on all of these tonight. Affordability, uh, the ability to choose a major in our program, um, the community that we offer here, Dr. Basil is going to talk about that. Um, the school being a faith-based institution, Dr. Wren is going to speak about that towards the end. Um, and of course, the rigorous liberal arts curriculum, which is at the heart of the Honors College. Alumni outcomes, uh, not as much, but we have some that we want to talk about. So, um, great. Well, all of these things are in some ways related to the question of happiness. Um, and so I wanted to start off with just a little quote um, by someone that you're going to read with Dr. Basil, if you wind up here in your freshman year. Um, let's see if we can do this here. There we go. All right. So let me just read this aloud. Since every kind of knowing and every choice reach towards some good, let us say what it is that of all the goods aimed at by action is the highest. In name, this is pretty much agreed about by the majority of people, for most people say that it is happiness. But about happiness, what it is, they are in dispute. So everyone agrees that we're seeking happiness, that all of our choices seek happiness, but we disagree about what happiness is. Um, just as all individuals in every choice they make seek happiness, in some ways, whether we state it or not, every institution of education, of higher education, and the choices they make are making some judgment about human happiness. And so I would argue as you go through uh, your, the time you spend in looking through and researching colleges and thinking about where you want to attend college, you should be asking the question, what does each institution I'm looking at either explicitly or implicitly say about what they hold happiness to be? Um, and we here at the Honors College have made a number of judgments about that. Um, and we're gonna talk about all of those tonight. Uh, in the course of the next 20 minutes or so, and then allow you to ask questions about all of those. So, um, you guys wanna add anything? That's good. Okay, all right. Um, well, I wanna share with you one other quote because I wanna begin with the heart of our program, which is, which most of you, uh, actually the highest number of you on the poll said was important to you, that's that rig rigorous liberal arts curriculum. And what does that have to do with happiness? Um, and I'm sharing with you a quote that we have from an article that all of our incoming freshmen read the summer before they arrive. Um, oh, did I leave off? 
the second end in her name, the other two ends. Well, anyway, <laughs> Eva Brand, who was the uh, longtime dean at St. John's College, a great books college in Annapolis, wrote an article, Why Should We Read?, which is about the benefits of a liberal education. And in that article, she says the following, the camp in which I live thinks that the central purpose of a liberal education is to give students a chance at working out a picture of happiness. Now, I think when institutions want to sell liberal education to parents and students, very often they point to the fact that liberal education is useful. It allows you to be versatile. You can, um, in, a, in an economy where students have to change from career to career, uh, have, being able to think critically is really important. And all of that is true. All of that is true. But we here at the Honors College, I think we, we have come to this judgment, we agree with Eva Brand, that the primary purpose of a liberal education is to give students a chance at working out a picture of happiness. Um, of course, we can't guarantee this, right? Just like a parent can't guarantee happiness for their children, a, a teacher can't guarantee happiness for their, for, for their students. But we think that this is the best way for students to try to sort through these questions of happiness. Does that make sense? Absolutely. That would just say, you know, I, I to, to give one practical application, I remember being a little younger and in college and um, thinking about, you know, what to major in. And there are, there are any number of things I felt I could major in. But um, the question for me was, well, what if I had a career that gave me a lot of money, you know, that'd be great. But what would money be for? What would I spend it on? What, what, what is it good for? Can it be happiness or, um, you know, it's pretty hard to be happy without money, but what is the relationship between money and happiness seems to be the, the kind of antecedent question. And um, I, I couldn't, I felt that I needed to figure that out. Um, and often, you know, before I, you know, now, now maybe I have a better answer to that, but it, it, you know, it took, took a little while. One, one thing that I would call out to say is that right in the brand quote, one, she, she uses the phrase, a picture of happiness. Uh, I think there's a number of things we could sort of extract from that phrase. One is that she's, there's an implication there that, that you could understand actually what the nature of happiness is, first of all, right? In other words, if you're engaging on a course of study that gives you all of these different and conflicting claims with regards to happiness, it's possible that the, the takeaway could be, well, there is actually no happiness or that there's no definitive, right, sort of ha happiness that's higher than all the rest. And there's no way in which we can establish a criteria by which we can determine which kind of happiness is the highest. Um, but I think that she's saying that there's a there's this picture, right, which kind of implies um, that it's not this absolute solid thing, but a kind of reflection of it. Um, and so I, I think there's a kind of versatility there uh, in, in the sense of it not being this absolute thing that just sort of appears your third year along in your, in your course of study, but a, but a very real, right, sort of real thing that comes out of the books that you study. And then, and then with regards to Aristotle's quote, right, he says that these different authors are in dispute. And that dispute has a really broad range, and it's one of the, the real, the, the delights of passing through our curriculum, um, the delights in the highest sense. I mean, in, in some ways, it, it can be a source of, right, interior questioning, and even a, the, in the best sense, a kind of interior searching and turmoil temporarily, because you have, right, Homer, right, may raise the question of what, what is what gives us happiness, right, having our revenge on someone else or finding our home after a long period of absence. And then, right, Aristotle might say that it's to permanently contemplate the truth. And then the Christians will come along and say that our happiness is really not of this world, ultimately, that everything that is created is, is somehow incomplete because it's not the creator. And then you go all the way to the, the modern period and you think of, you run into someone like Immanuel Kant who will say, actually, really, we really shouldn't try to be happy at all. We should try to do right, what is right and what is good, regardless of whether it will make us happy 
Um, and so, you know, you learn through engaging in that rigorous exposure to these primary texts um, to have to give an account and to determine which of these is the most true and the most, the most compelling. As you can see, I brought up here, um, I'm sharing the screen with you now, and I'm going to talk about these three options here in just a minute. Um, but we'll look at the most comprehensive of our three options, which lays out these conflicting views that Dr. Wren pointed to. And while we have tried to avoid a curriculum where we have a hundred views that we treat in a very surface way, we did divide our curriculum up into three main perspectives. And as you can see during freshman year, students engage in a very rigorous study of classical thought, beginning with the epics, moving on to Plato, uh, on to Plato, Greek tragedy, a course on the trivium, which is Aristotle's works on logic. And then in the spring, reading the great Greek histories, reading Aristotle, reading some Roman authors and engaging even in their math course in treating the father of, uh, of Greek geometry, Euclid. During the sophomore and junior year, uh, Dr. Wren uh, sort of previewed this a bit in mentioning the emergence of Christianity, which students experience through the reading of scripture during the fall of their uh, sophomore year. And two great uh, doctors of the church, St. Augustine and St. Aquinas, as well as in some options, other fathers of the church. And a, a second course in the trivium, which is, uh, we have a two section, sorry, a, a two part course in the trivium freshman and sophomore year which are dedicated to grammar, logic, and rhetoric. And so during the second year, we focus more on rhetoric and poetics. We then move uh, during junior year um, and senior and sophomore year into examining the moderns, which is our third perspective, with an entire course on the American founding, modern philosophy, modern political philosophy as well. Um, and they offer in, in some ways, some of these moderns, they agree with the Christians and the ancients, but in most, in, in very significant ways, disagree with them as well. Um, so, yeah, what else do we want to add? About that? Significantly disagree. Significantly, yeah. right. <laughs> okay. um, but what is real, truly unique is actually our senior year, which is very different from any other great books curriculum currently. And you can see here that during the senior year, we have courses entitled The Crises in the West. Um, what these courses aim to do is bring the wisdom and the questions that students have engaged in uh, through their examination of the ancients, the Christians, and the moderns during their first three years to bear on contemporary intellectual and moral crises. Um, there are certainly more than the ones that we have indicated and chosen to treat in our curriculum but we found these to be some of the most important. Um, and what these courses do is um, integrate some of the traditional great books in the canon, but also include um, voices of contemporary scholars, philosophers, theologians, uh, scientists as well. And in each course, we include a Christian response to that conversation. Um, so, do you want to answer? Yeah, I would just add that in that year, the crises of the West, most, most of the works that we will read are written by authors who, even if they are relatively contemporary, were themselves steeped in the great books tradition or the tradition of the Western Catholic intellectual tradition. Yeah. You can see some of these here, freshmen, I'm sorry, uh, in the fall, history and the idea of progress, science and technology, the drama of modern atheism, a course on Tocqueville, who is dealing with modern liberal democracy, um, freedom, rights, and virtue, certainly um, love, friendship, and marriage, um, clearly uh, a crisis in how we're defining and understanding those things these days. And yeah, and, and just to, to add to that, I mean, this is so unique, but if you, if you think about it, um, so many of the or not even say neuroses of the modern world can be traced to um, problems in education and uh, problems in a crisis of reason. And, um, and I think it is
is an incredible opportunity to think through where we are now, you know, but in this senior year, but you can really only understand where we are now in contemporary politics, in contemporary theology, uh, in contemporary philosophy, and in art, uh, music, so many different things, literature, uh, if you understand where we've come from right. and what we are either building on or rebelling against right. or in grave doubt about. And, um, you know, I am, I personally, this is one of the greatest perks for me to be able to teach in this program is to engage with these perennial questions, these, these questions that do not go away, uh, no matter how old you are, no matter how much you've read, no matter how little you've read. These are questions that are the questions of your life. And to be able to engage those questions with the best minds, the best thinkers, and with serious students in community is just one of the greatest privileges of my life. Agreed. And just adding on to something that Dr. Basil just said, uh, you know, I think that it's, it's possible, and this happens oftentimes in, let's say, a Western Civ course, that you'll get sort of this chronological explanation of, of different positions or ideas, right? Like this is what the Greeks thought, and then humanity kind of grows up, and then right, this is what the Christians thought, and then, and, and then right, but we're, we're no longer living in those historical periods, and so those ideas are kind of extinct, or they're so tied up with the contingencies of their time that they have no real bearing on our present moment. And so we, it takes a while because a lot of our students, when they come here, they've, they maybe have been exposed to that way of, of thinking as well, which is, we sometimes call this, call it historicism, this, this kind of, this, this historical relativism, that ideas are just sort of outgrowths of a particular period. Um, but, you know, so, so there is a kind of purification maybe of that that, that happens after a couple of semesters in the, in the honors college. Um, and then what, but once you, once you, once that happens, right, you can, you can actually have a genuine conversation between someone who lived in 750 BC and someone who lived in 750 AD, right, and they're, and treat it as though both of these authors are, merit the, the exact same amount of, of, of consideration uh, of weighing their, the, the truth of their claims. And then further, I would add to that, that, right, um, that even though we live in a, a, you know, as Dr. Wysocki said, a liberal democracy, right, it, it, we're able to not just restrict the answers to these possible questions that we're asking to answers that are given by moderns, right, as though because we live in this modern liberal democracy, we might as well just come up with answers that are practical given the moment that we, that we live in. Instead, we're able to say, well, maybe some of the answers that are endemic to modernity need some some serious reconsideration. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, on all of these crises that we're experiencing today, so often we think the only answers are those given by MSNBC or Fox News, right, depending on your political leanings. And, and both of those, in a certain sense, assume the same things, um, and that is certain uh, assumptions of liberal democracy, right? Um, and, and if there's nothing to correct that from outside, uh, then we're, we're in, a, in pretty sad shape. But I think, um, again, not guaranteeing that th this honors college will save America, right? But I think without things like this, without these types of conversations, uh, hope <laughs> for, for change is, is um, just not right. Yeah, well, yeah. For, for civic discourse in right. general, I mean, it, you know, I, I think, I, only have time to follow a few issues. I follow as many as I can, but one is, you know, freedom of speech and, and freedom of speech on campus in particular, which seems to be, you know, so many universities have become ideological boot camps um, for our, our young youth. And, you know, the, the thing that they're taught uh, primarily is that reason really doesn't have access to truth, um, that, that human reason is so limited and so that only thing that counts is my personal feeling about a particular issue. And so speech comes to be seen as a form of violence or manipulation or force. And that's simply not the case. But, but 
but so many of the campus protests are based on the idea that reason does not have access to truth. And I, I think um, that is one of the great gifts of being here is that, well, we have a somewhat archaic, but uh, are founded on a somewhat archaic, but I think ultimately true uh, belief that reason can make progress towards the truth. And for that reason, uh, conversation about these extraordinarily controversial questions is not a form of assault, but is rather a form uh, by which we come to conform our own lives uh, to the truth itself um, in dialogue through conversation and a conversation that is rooted in friendship um, and, and community and that that is, hmm, I can't imagine what you'd be anywhere else, you know. I, God bless the idea. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, just an example of, I mean, we, we've hit on so much here. One of these, these questions that was asked a long time ago, and is still so important, and we're thinking through it today, and it's fundamental for our lives, and we can use reason, it's related to happiness. Um, in your freshman year, uh, fall semester, with Dr. Basil, you'll read the Mino, which is a platonic dialogue. And it opens up with a really audacious guy who asks Socrates a question. He says, tell me, Socrates, is virtue, uh, how does one come to become virtuous? Is it through teaching? Is it through habit? Is it by nature? Or is it something else? And right, the assumption is virtue is one of these things that makes us happy. And we want to know how to pass that on. Parents want to know how to give it to their children. Students want to learn how to get it. They want to figure out how to get it. And this question, right? I mean, is it through habit? Uh, maybe in some ways, but there seems to be limits to that. Can it be taught through a lecture? Maybe in some ways, right? Is it, it, are some people just more naturally, do they possess certain virtues? They seem to be more temperate than others, more courageous than others. If so, what does that mean, right? And maybe by something else, something like for Christians, maybe grace. Um, and so I think whatever our answer is to that question, we can always re-ask it, right? That question is always alive um, and we can always come back to it no matter how much psychology or sociology or whatever else it is that we read in, in our modern right, research, right? The question is, has not, 2000 later has not been closed. Um, so, um, just to move on, I, I, there's so much more we can say. I mean, we could talk for hours about our curriculum, um, but some other elements that we wanted to highlight. Uh, one is the fact, and I'll go back to um, the three various options in our program. One thing that has made us truly unique is the fact that we have a four-year program um, where students can take only our great books courses, Ancients, Christians, Moderns, Crises of the West. And we think that there's great benefit to doing that. But we offer two other flexible options, which involve many of the same courses, but fewer of them. Uh, and we, so we have option two and option three. Option two uh, is a 92 credit. This is actually a mistake here. But there are 92 credits out of 120 credits in the grade books, which allow students to choose any minor offered at Belmont Abbey College to choose internships, to take internships for credits, to take classes in maybe something practical uh, that they would be interested in taking a course in computer programming and data science, courses in languages, or just courses with their favorite professors. You may find you have a professor in the Honors College like Dr. Wren often teaches a course in creative writing, um, and you would wanna take that creative writing course with Dr. Wren. Uh, some of our literature professors teach courses in Flannery O'Connor. Um, you may wanna take a class there. Uh, extra courses in Latin, in Greek. That's all available under option two. What's been the most popular so far has been option three, which is uh, 77 credits. It's the same courses, fewer of them. As you can see, they're replaced. We replace some of the courses with courses in an academic major. So you, under this um, option three, can choose any major offered at Belmont Abbey College. And you can see we have a whole lot of them, majors and minors here, in the humanities, in professional studies, business, marketing, economics, in the social sciences, government, criminal justice, psychology, education. And so you can pair any one of those majors with 
a really great uh, great books curriculum that's still four years ancient christians moderns um, but we just differentiate between the more foundational classes and then those for students who want to go further into the Greek books. Um, and, and you know, this, we, we relate this, again, we're making a choice about happiness here. And so we didn't just do this because we thought, hey, maybe that will draw more students to the program. We think in some ways that this choice helps our students to be happy and, and in two ways. Uh, one is simply that part of happiness for, um, for all of us is figuring out what our vocation is. Um, and for some of us, right, being a, a really great business leader who has a foundation in the great books would be their vocation. For other of our students, we have students now, right, who, who want to go into the medical field. They, they become nurses, they go to nursing school, uh, they become doctors, um, they go on into the military, they go on into active politics, uh, they become lawyers. And for them, the ability to study chemistry and biology while studying the great books and, and completing a degree within four years uh, really makes them happy because they get to explore um, the things that they love and that they're good at and really develop those talents. But, but also, um, and while I would argue, I think all of us would argue that doing all great books would prepare you for really any career that you want. Sometimes uh, if you want to become a CPA, a public accountant, Right, you have to take accounting courses. If you want to go to medical school, you have to take prerequisites. And so that path to, the career, to a career for some students is going to be through that particular major. And we give you the ability to do that. And, and we're, we acknowledge that <clears throat> while happiness comes through the examination of these really interesting questions that we've talked about, that a sort of necessary but not sufficient condition for happiness is to not be anxious all the time about money. Um, and so that Right, both the ability to choose a major and, and, and have a career path sort of set out with your advisor as you go through your four years here, and the affordability of the Honors College that we'll talk about in just a minute, are ways that we want to contribute to that practical need uh, for, as, as Dave Ramsey says, if there are any parents out there, for financial peace. Um, and we understand the, the relationship between that and happiness as well. Or just briefly add to that, that you know, I think that the, the, the third option, which Dr. Wesak was talking about, where you can choose a pre-med track, right, which a number of our students have chosen, right? I mean, they're, they're going into the, the field of medicine, right, because they want to serve other people by healing them. And I think that, right, sometimes in, in, in great books, colleges that only offer 120 credits and that's it, right? Um, students and professors alike can oftentimes become sort of walking Cartesian minds <laughs> to use a, a, right, a, a thinker who will read at a, a midway through our, our course of study, right? But where the life of the mind almost becomes all important in a sense that it sort of is exaggerated in its importance. I'm not saying that it, it's not the highest thing outside of say, the life of, of prayer and life of the soul and, and acts of love. Um, but what I'm saying is that I think we're also making the choice that we are making as an acknowledgement that our happiness can come through, right, through doing these, through doing good, through our, our, our jobs, right, in a very real sense. So that it might be partially through thinking and asking questions and having conversations, but also through these, these, these practical actions that will be tied up with our, our careers. Yeah, and I mean, being a good leader, right, I mean, being a good leader who can help lead other souls to happiness, right, insofar as that's possible, right, might require both, right, this great books education paired with something else. So, I mean, just the benefit that a business leader could have, right, in thinking, I, I want my employees to be happy. Insofar as that's within my power, I want them to be happy. Well, having thought about the questions related to money at the beginning of Aristotle's politics um, is important, right? Because then you can, if you're an employee, you see an employee who is seeking happiness through rising very quickly through the ranks, mm -hmm. right? And there seems to be an inordinate love for promotion. You can then have that conversation, right? Mm -hmm. Hey, are you happy? How are things at home, right? Um, the work-life balance, this is a term we use all the time now, but I mean, 
I think a great books education is really is a way to help out with questions like work life balance. And if you're leading others, right, that's going to be very important. Yeah, and the leading others thing. Just one last thing that I would add to that is that you know I think that a lot of the books that we read help us to understand human nature, and anyone who understands human nature will be a better boss, a better leader, a better father, a better mother, right, a better spouse. Just without question. Um, okay. Well, um, you feel free. Uh, there's a chat bar up. Uh, feel free to jump in with questions at any time, and we'll answer these real time. But um, I did want um, to talk a little bit about the community, the, the, the particulars of the community we're fostering here, and the faith tradition, and how we integrate what we're doing here to Belmont Abbey's commitment um, to its mission as a Catholic and Benedictine institution. So, do you want to talk a little sure. bit about the community? Um, yeah, so I don't know how I became the, uh, the community central, but you know, uh, I, yeah, I really like community, really like this community. Um, you know, we're centered in the Benedictine tradition, and I know uh, John Chua, Ryan, and Dr. Ryan will be able to talk about this more in a second, but just uh, to know that there are sort of 10 hallmarks of Benedictine ed education, um, and, and I'll just highlight two as I enter into thinking about community. One is that um, we are, all oh, one of the Benedictine hallmarks is greeting everyone in person with person. So anyone who comes to our doors is seen as uh, an image of Christ, and, and so when you, you were when we welcome our students into the home of the monks, and what is, uh, for, you know, um, has been for me quite a home throughout my life. I graduated, did my undergraduate here, as, as well as uh, Dr. Waisaki, um, that you're welcoming this person into our home as Christ, and, and they are became part of our community. Not only that, but that, um, you know, the, the other wonderful Benedictine homework is hospitality. That you know that that we are we are here to, to welcome you um, in the person of Christ, in, in, you know, um, and and just to welcome you into into the goodness of community. So, um, you know, if I were going to add one crisis of the West to our curriculum, I think our curriculum is amazing. But I would I would say there's a crisis of loneliness uh, in the modern world, and this this is across. Uh, this is really kind of astonishing. The if you've watched, looked at any of the news, the deaths of despair, and just just the, the, those who are literally dying of loneliness, um, that um, in, in some sense, as there's so much more to education than uh, can be taught in a classroom. And for that reason, we find that our pursuit of truth and beauty and, and goodness within the classroom has a way of sort of penetrating the rest of our lives. And, and it should, uh, because, you know, we're all searching um, for, for friendship. Aristotle says in his Nicomachean Ethics that, you know, without friends, no one would choose to live. You could have everything else in life, but without friends, no one would choose to, to live. Friends are as necessary to life as food and drink are. And I, I think this is profoundly true, but, you know, also in the Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle describes different kinds of friendships. And, you know, there are friendships of utility um, in which, you know, this is kind of a transactional relationship. Maybe your, your local checkout clerk at the grocery store, you know, that kind of friendship of utility. It's very fleeting. It's based on utility. A friendship of pleasure, which could be anything from the friendship of lovers or uh, a friendship of wit. And, and finally, a friendship of the good. Now, the friendship of the good is the thing that we want most of all because it's, it's the most complete thing. Um, but in order for a friendship to be lasting, it has to be centered around some sort of common good. And the most lasting of all goods, the most sort of, is the truth itself. And so to have the opportunity to form friendships uh, in a community, uh, in pursuit of truth, is the kind of thing that makes life worth living to be, to be. You know, I mean, no, I can't guarantee you happiness, but it can get you pretty, pretty darn close. I mean, yes, this the side of the great divide, of course. And, uh, you know, I, in addition to this, um, you know, to foster that, we've done a number of things. We have um, weekly opportunities for breakfast together. Um, you know, we have many, many cultural events. We go to at least two different uh, either symphonies. We went to Les Mis a couple of weeks ago. It was amazing. Um, so we're always looking for good cultural events to go to. And in addition to that, um, we do a couple other things. Um, just 
sort of off the record office hours, you know, students sometimes come by to talk about their paper, but you know, sometimes we just have a weekly coffee hour, or at least I do, I do with the ladies. I don't know if the guys have started that yet, but like your, your weekly coffee and tea hour. Um, and, and, and we also do our, do our best to you know, get together for bonfires. Um, song and poetry is sort of central to liberal education. And so as often as we can, at least once or twice a semester, we're making sure that we, we get together to, to sing and just celebrate life around the around bonfire. And um, it's, a, it's, a, it's incredible to see this community thrive. And um, I think if you just talk to any one of our students, what you'll see is that they're, unlike other college students in so many ways, but the most remarkable thing is that they walk around with smiles on their faces and they are happy to be together. They are some, you know, the other thing, okay, this is just weird, but or maybe it's not weird, I don't, I don't know. But like, if you walk into, when I walk into my classroom, this has become remarkable to me, almost no one is on their cell phone because they're all busy talking. And, and this is at odds with every other university I've taught at. I've taught at three other universities um, since I got my PhD. And um, I, you know, every other university you walk into class, it's dead silent because everybody's on their cell phone. Yeah. My students, by golly, they are rambunctious. And by golly, they are friends. They're oftentimes talking about something that yeah. they were discussing yeah. in the previous class that they haven't been able to hash out, which is wonderful, right? I mean, yeah. they're still kind of obsessed with that. This is a conversation that does not die easily. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of <clears throat> conversation we have, it looks like we have a question from anonymous attendee. Hello anonymous. Hello anonymous. <laughs> Are you the person that wrote Beowulf? I'm wondering. Because I don't know. Sorry. That's a, that's a, all right. That's the question. There are a lot of colleges, here's from Anonymous Attendee, there are a lot of colleges that are asserting the value of great books, and your program sits within a larger collegiate community. Is there any, dis any distinctive in your program that influences the broader Belmont Abbey community? Uh, <clears throat> is there anything distinctive in your program that influences the broader I Belmont Abbey community? Good. Okay. Yeah. Rose, you shout out? Sure, yeah. So, I mean, I think, I think I would kind of answer this question in part by segueing into the, the question of right faith here and how it's lived out. And then I'll, I'll try to answer the question in and of itself. Uh, but I think it's tied to uh, just the, the dynamics of the Abbey taken as a whole. And I, I, I think we, you know, that, that Belmont Abbey College is on the Newman God. So there's a very serious commitment to, to reclaim or to continue to claim the importance of the Catholic intellectual tradition, um, to offer mass on campus every day at 11 a.m. Uh, with the monastic community. And then soon, it seems, maybe in a year or two, we'll probably have evening masses in many of the nights of the week. We have a Eucharistic Adoration Chapel that's extraordinarily beautiful, St. Joseph's Chapel. Um, and. And there are a lot of professors who come here because they, they could not abide to compartmentalize their faith or to work and live and teach at a place that requires them to be extraordinarily uh, you know, sophisticated and Jesuitical about their, their Christian commitments. Um, but going beyond that, right, just the, the impossibility of answering certain questions without the lights of revelation. Um, so the, the campus as a whole is, is committed to that. Now, that being said, it's, it is also a, it's mission territory uh, at Belmont Abbey in the sense that the broader student body uh, is not predominantly Catholic. Um, and and we, you, can, you can look at that in a number of ways. I think that we in the Honors College look at it as an opportunity for evangelization and leavening because within the Honors College, the dynamics are very different, right? So I think it's something like 95% of the students who are in honors are Catholic or Christian, um, as opposed to the, the regular student body. And so um, in terms of the, the ways in which we can influence the rest of the campus, certainly our students set the standard for intellectual rigor for the rest of the campus. I mean, they spend their times together in, in the dining hall, continuing to, to talk about Aristotle. Um, but they also, they also uh, are, are, you know, are, I guess, for lack of a better way of putting it, excellent in their pursuit of, of their faith in what 
I mean by that is ever since the honors college was launched, we see uh, attendance at daily mass increase. Um, and that's partially because of the efforts of campus ministry in a broader sense, but it's also partially because uh, the, our, the honors college itself has attracted a lot of students who, who, who love, who love the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, who love praying songs with the monks. And, and so that, that, that shows, those are some of the ways, I guess, that I would say that, um, that both, that the, that speaking to both um, faith more broadly, but then also how the Honors College influences the rest of the campus in a distinctive way. Um, then other, a couple other things that I would just point to um, is um, in, in the curriculum itself, right? So for most Catholic or Christian schools, right, even in, even in, even in those schools, those very rare schools that still maintain a robust core, and it's very unusual, right? Um, you're going to take at most two or three theology classes. In fact, at most Catholic schools, it's gonna be one or two at this point. Um, in the Honors College, you are taking not one or two classes, but two whole semesters uh, committed to Christian thought. And so, um, and so that, that um, sorry, there's a question coming in. Oh, no. uh, so that, uh, uh, that, that's a, an extraordinarily extensive kind of engagement with, uh, with people who are trying to reason through the implications of Christian revelation. And then I would add to that just that we also, you know, Dr. Osek mentioned earlier that we do read sacred scripture as part of your course of study. And unlike other great books, colleges, we treat it as sacred, sacred the adjective sacred is, <laughs> we take that very seriously, right? It's not the Bible as literature is just another, uh, another one among many sources of human wisdom, um, but, but distinctive and higher than the rest. We have another question <clears throat> from Josie. Uh, how would a Christian student who is not Catholic fit in on campus? So, um, well, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, one, one thing just to, to jump right in with that is yeah, a lot of our, our students are Catholic in the Honors College, but, um, Extraordinarily, that's not the case of the larger campus. And I mean, just to emphasize that, that Benedictine hallmark, if, if you're coming here, um, our guarantee to you is, is that we're welcoming you in Persona Christi uh, with hospitality. And yeah. um, there is, uh, you know, I, I think within that, you know, we have a number of Protestant students, there's some of my guests, and as far as I can tell, they're very happy here. and. You know, it, it's part of a larger conversation, I think, um, in, in the Great Books tradition sometimes, it, especially with the text we're reading from Augustine to Aquinas um, to, to Luther and some of the later, later uh, specifically Protestant authors, that, you, you know, that, that this is a question of what unites us and what, what divides us. And I think, uh, especially in, in these times, there is so much of an emphasis on, on really what unites uh, Christians believers um, and and that really fits pretty nicely into this community um, you know we're not Bob Jones um, but we're also not the Bob Jones of Catholic University so, um, you know you you are very welcome here absolutely and, yeah. uh, and then I, I suspect could be quite happy believe it or not yeah and I think you know one way that that plays itself out in I would say in all of our classes to be sure would be that um, if we're talking about Plato or Locke or Rousseau or Shakespeare, uh, a simple appeal to the catechism or Catholic dogma to explain the position of someone else is not going to cut it, right? So if we're, if we're, if we're going through St. Augustine, right, and, and we're struggling through that, right, a sort of appeal to some Catholic authority on St. Augustine is not going to work. Yeah, right, right. Like, what is the relationship between nature and grace? And then, right, we're, 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 we're reading Augustine's treatise on that, a couple hundred pages, and then someone says, well, but I, I learned when I was in eighth grade, you know, that it's, that the relationship between nature and grace is this, right? Um, you know, that, that, may, that may be true, right? and then we're actually, uh, we're not denying that that may be true, but, but just as a way of, 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 of answering the question, it's, it's unsatisfactory and that it's, it's not engaging your, your reason, right? It's not giving a reasoned account. 
And I think, yeah, I mean, the, the text that we're going to be treating would be of interest to, to everyone, right? And so the Calvinist, the Calvinist tradition treats St. Augustine, they, they take St. Augustine very seriously. Right? Um, and so, um, you know, my experience in recruiting students has been that within the classical schooling movement, um, where students have been very attracted to programs like ours, um, there seem to be three, three faith traditions that are very interested in this, and I would be happy to have students from all of them. Uh, you know, the, the Calvinist tradition, the, the Orthodox tradition, the Catholic tradition are the big ones. There, there are some outside of that as well, but um, <clears throat> uh, send them here. We, anybody who's a seeker after truth uh, are the types of students that we want to have. Uh, and, and the honors college students mirror that as well. You know, they may argue vigorously for the positions of their Catholic faith, but they don't dismiss, uh, and at least that I have seen, right? They're not, they don't dismiss the opinions of of a non-Catholic in class who disagrees with position, right? And they, they will engage with them, so. I suppose that I tend to think, um, I mean, my, I got my PhD at a Baptist, the largest Baptist university in America, and it was a phenomenal economic, uh, ecumenical time for me, and I, I, I think there's something in kind here. Yeah. It also serves the, uh, the very good function of, uh, of allowing our Catholic students to not become lazy, right? Uh, they, they, you can become lazy and, and say, well, these truths that I've accepted because of my, my catechetical de you know, development, I, I can just assume that these are true in, in the arguments that I make without having to defend them or think through them myself and try to come to understand them. Uh, <clears throat> Plato makes a distinction in many of the books that we'll read between true opinion and knowledge knowledge, um, true opinion would be, you know, grasping something that happens to be true without the ability to give an account for it and truly understand it. And very often, um, you know, we all, we all hold many things based on true opinion and, and our Catholic students do too. And so the, the challenge of someone who's not Catholic to come along and say, hold up, right? That doesn't make sense to me. Explain it. Um, is, is really beneficial to our Catholic students. And so it's, I think it's beneficial for all uh, to have that kind of ecumenism in the program. Oh yeah, affordability yeah. and money. We should. Yeah. Oh, I was going to do that in the middle, so we didn't end with the low. But um, <laughs> we will. Anyway, um, students who are admitted to the honors college um, have an, the possibility to have an incredible deal when it comes to affordability. Um, honors college scholarships for everyone who is able to is entered enters in the program range from eighty five hundred dollars a year to ten thousand dollars a year. Um, depending on whether one's in state or out of state and whether one's filled out a FAFSA. Our tuition at Belmont Abbey College was reset about five or six years ago. And we have not increased it since. It was, uh, we decreased it by about a third to 18,500 a year, which means that students would be paying in the Honors College 8,500 to $10,000 a year after their scholarship um, in tuition. Now you add room and board to that, but it's still incredibly competitive. Um, certainly with, with private schools, but we're finding even in North Carolina that we're really competitive with public schools. So you can come to, after everything is said and done, to get a private, at a Catholic college, great books education, um, which is completely unique, period, and very unique to this region, um, is just incredibly affordable. So, so in terms of how that's tied to happiness, I mean, right, I, I think that it's probably, it's probably clear to those of you who are parents, uh, but right, I mean, having to co-sign a loan that's that's far lower than most of your children's peers, right, would be a, a source of, of relief, uh, you know, a, an unburdening of that potential stress. But also for for you student, you future college students who are out there, or parents who are thinking about their your children's futures, I mean, you know, being able to graduate knowing that it's not going to take. 50 years or 20 years even to pay off your student debt makes for a, a, a radically different life, a radically different human life. Right? I mean, we all, I'm sure, have friends uh, and family members who are indentured servants to the bank, right? And whose every move and every decision in life is, is tied somehow to that really high loan payment that's coming in every month. So, 
I think for from my vantage point, right, it's easier to be a professor at a, at a, at a, in a program at a school that offers a, a, what I would call an eth you know, an ethical <laughs> tuition cost um, because I can in good conscience then welcome students into to undertaking this pursuit without without feeling like we're sort of setting them up for this burden. Yeah. I mean, I think even with all the goods we've articulated, if it, if it was sixty thousand dollars a year to to come and engage in that, then then the question of happiness becomes more difficult. Uh, I would still say it's worth it, but <laughs> I, I, sure. it's, it's it's harder to make the argument. So right. I think it's just incredible. Um, you know. Just the, I mean, the other perks financially that come with the program, right, are that uh, the, the events that Dr. Basil mentioned are sponsored by the Honors College. So the beach retreat after sophomore year, the cultural events, uh, and the travel abroad to Ireland um, are, are subsidized. The travel abroad is subsidized. We pay about half of that after your sophomore, uh, junior year. Um, but um, that, that's added in there as well. And that's, you know, probably to talk in terms of value would be another $5,000 over the course of your, uh, <clears throat> over your four years here in, in community events. So. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, are there any other questions? Uh, Dr. Basil has to head off to uh, a lecture. Delighted um, to meet you all sort of. Uh, thanks for the questions. See you all later, I hope. <laughs> We'll stay on. It looks like there are six of you left. If you have any other questions. Well, we want to thank all of you. Oh, oh yes. Thank you. Well, thank you. We want to thank all of you for, for taking the time out of your evening to spend with us. And uh, we'll be sending a follow-up email with our uh, contact information. Um, Wonderful. Glad to hear that some of you will be considering us. Uh, we'll be sending out an email um, with our contact information, and uh, we hope to see some applications from you in the coming years. God bless. God bless you.